Featured human settlement in which uh, human activities are integrated with the natural world in a way that's sustainable into the indefinite future. Um, a family home on the farm that converted it to a hostel, and so we went back and started um, putting in dormitory beds and, and uh, extra showers, have uh, some workshop space and some gardens and things, and be able to, to show in microcosm what the farm had been doing as the larger entity for 30 years and so we created this sort of model little village within the village here at the Eco Village Training Center. Now we've got um, a two kilowatt a solar array to provide off-site power or on-site power. We've got um, water catchment on all the roofs so we're actually channeling from the gutters into the cisterns. Uh, we're, we've attached a greenhouse for keeping plants uh, healthy in the winter. We've got um, different systems in place for, for providing for the comforts for all people who come for the workshops. And in a way that doesn't use a lot of utilities or external off-site power. Well, we've got a little wireless network here so the whole area is kind of a Wi-Fi uh, zone for people who have computers and want to stay connected. The gray water that comes off the showers it's rich in shampoos and uh, phosphate based things and so we say okay that's a nutrient what are we going to do with it what what likes to grow and that sort of thing and it turns out the phosphates are really good for growing uh, all kinds of plants so we have a series of ponds here little constructed wetlands that carries the water from the showers through the through the system and into the chicken and duck area it's a little cob chicken coop that was uh, built in the using clay from the ground right below our feet and local sand and straw uh, to make a little space for the animals. And then the ponds uh, circle around. There's a little uh, solar powered pump with a photovoltaic array uh, and the, the pump carries around the, the water to the top of the system, flows through the solar shower system again and back down here. This is a uh, straw bale greenhouse doesn't look much like a greenhouse this time of year because we've got the top taken off. But in the winter, this will be where we'll keep a lot of the plants that uh, we'll need for winter food. Uh, the back wall is a straw bale wall and there's a couple ways of doing that. One would be just to cover it and stucco it with clay or cement or lime. Uh, and just keep it as a permanent insulating wall. Uh, what we do is we expose it and what that means is that because it gets wet it's going to have to be replaced every few years but then we'll take the straw out and use it for mulch so it's not a waste. Uh, and the reason we do that, which we, the reason we like that as opposed to a permanent wall is that as the straw gets wet it, tr it puts out heat and so in the late spring, late, late fall or early spring We'll get, uh, we'll moisten that back wall as we're watering the plants, and the heat that's produced is enough just to keep the greenhouse warm without any external heat. So, we try to have a lot of plants um, mixed together in beds rather than whole big sections of monocrop. Mono uh, so we're, we're we're thinking here of uh, companion planting and. Um, maximal use of minerals uh, and dynamic accumulation by one plant that then uh, provides for a succession into another plant and so forth. Uh, how to deal with climate change in a way that's a positive switch so we're actually taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. The question is how can you make forests provide um, more value to humans and to commerce standing than they do if you cut them down and saw them up and turn the place into a cattle yard. And uh, one of the ways we found was mushrooms. So what we have here is a shiitake mushroom plantation. 
uh, the, the spawn is inoculated into the log and after four to six months it starts producing mushrooms and over the life of a log it'll probably produce something like uh, the weight of the log in mushrooms. The, what this has done is it's demonstrated you can get a very valuable resource, this wonderful medicinal and food value mushroom, gourmet mushroom, out of uh, a, a forest without cutting down the trees and you actually make more money that way than you would if you cut down the trees. We're also finding uses for these old C-band satellite dishes. This is a big old satellite dish. Everybody going to these smaller dishes these days, you know. And uh, these things are out there to be had. They make a lovely little roof for a structure like this clay oven. But they also could be used for a composting toilet or a, a small addition to a house or any number of things. Yeah, a living roof is actually quite uh, helpful in many ways. It cools the building, so um, the process of evaporation and transpiration in the plants that are on the roof sends, it's just like exactly the same way a refrigerator works. The cold drops as the heat rises, and so you're actually transmitting cool into the building through the summer, and it'll be about 15 degrees cooler in there than it is outside. So, grey water that comes from the house is coming into a constructed wetland system here. Its primary purpose is to take the nutrient value of the remaining, any grey water that's coming off of the duck ponds or the solar showers, but also the kitchen sinks, the bathtubs and everything else in the house, and putting it into here where it goes through a, an alternating series of lagoons and reed beds. The model that could fit um, most developers, uh, most subdivisions in North America, which are about 300 residents. And so that 11,000 square feet that we're using for that is a model for how you could do sewage without having to pump it clear across the county to some sewage treatment plant that costs you $25 million to build and then gets dumped into the nearest river anytime it rains. Okay, so this, we call this uh, building the Green Dragon. Still a building under construction, and uh, a lot of the, what we do here is show people how to do different kinds of natural building. Uh, so this building will probably remain under construction for some years to come because it's part of our toolkit for teaching. Uh, and this is a building that uses straw bale, it uses earth bag, it uses timber frame, it uses round pole construction, adobe, uh, cord cob, um, different kinds of uh, elements, all of it coming from the surrounds, immediately within reach, forest right here, or the clay under your feet. Or are we going to have something that stays in a harmonious relationship with nature, doesn't steal from the future, uses the resources on site to optimal advantage and so forth. Little cabins that we're putting in here, uh, our idea is that people come for oh say a month long apprenticeship and after a while it's kind of tight confines to stay in the dormitory for that long a time and what we really need is a bunch of small backpacker cabins on site where people can come and have a little hermitage that they could live in for a month. So we're building these backpacker cabins which we call hippie tats as in hippie tat for humanity uh, that anybody can build and we're using straw bale and cob and earth bag and um, various timber frame components oh, to pretty. make these little structures. Looks like you got that uh, back room all smoothed out, huh? Uh-huh. Nice. Yeah, just putting on some lime tape. Yeah, and that'll make it look a lot uh, bigger, actually, at uh, having white walls. Indefinite future. That's a key phrase, because we really don't know what's coming. I mean, we read Lovelock's book, Revenge of Gaia, which tells us that we're all going to be migrating toward the poles, uh, trying to get away from global warming, and that it's going to become a very um, uh, smaller world population very quickly. And we don't know, you know, what's going to, ha what's going to happen in the southwest, what's going to happen out by the coast with the rising of the seas in response to melting ice and expanding oceans, you know. And so um, it's an indefinite future. And what you have to do when, when you're planning any eco-settlement of any kind is think about what are the 
uh, deficiencies, what are the abundances, what, are, what do you have scarcity of, what do you have a lot of, and um, work with that. Some of what we've been trying to do is to show that you don't have to be indebted to the bank to have a nice place to live. But you may need to scale down your expectations a little bit and consider whether it's really necessary to live in a big old Mac mansion or whether something a little smaller would be okay. And each of the buildings that we've got here, this Appalachian cabin over here, geodesic dome, the bigger straw bale cabin, runs about $5,000 in materials. And then a bunch of people can get together and put it up in a fairly short amount of time, a couple of weeks. So really, we've taken the bank out of the equation by doing that. And then really the issue is, can you, can you downsize your own expectations? And that's really a challenge for our time. Uh, we're entering an era of creative energy decline where we use less of everything actually, energy and a lot of resources which are becoming scarcer and scarcer. And so how can we downsize our expectations? And the answer is by creating elegance at a, at a smaller scale. That you find out what is it that people really want, what is it they really need. This building here doesn't look like a very big house, but you know, our ancestors just two generations back would have lived in a house like that most places and considered it pretty good. That's the size that Thomas Jefferson moved into when he first built Monticello. Uh, <laughs> he and his wife settled into a house just like that. I mean, gradually over the years he kept building it up, but that was the size it was at the start. People have to begin to think about creating eco-villages in denser settlements and urban areas because it's not responsible in an era of shrinking biodiversity to go out and take over green fields saying, oh, these aren't inhabited, let's go ahead and put in some subdivision here. When in fact they are inhabited, they're inhabited by myriad wild creatures that are using those green resources. We can't keep taking from them. There aren't gonna be enough to support the web of nature that supports us.